and bear with me as it's um, preparing to go live to the NCADD Facebook page. All right, I think that's good to go. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I think that's good to go. Do you all hear that? Okay. Um, I just want to make sure that, that is not heard. Oh, we still have technical difficulties. All right, give me a second. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and just get started. I think we're gonna be good. Um I know what it is now. All right, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and get started. So um, welcome and thank you for tuning into uh, this special series of conversations from Celebrating Families, which is a new series that started at the top of this year that essentially speaks with real people in a raw way about their experience and their understanding of substance use disorder, which is also known as SUD as well as mental health. And so these conversations are guided by a prevention evidence-based curriculum that is called Celebrating Families. And so I am Lauren Stovall. I am a certified prevention specialist with NCADD, uh, which is National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence. We are the Greater Detroit Area Chapter. And I'm a presenter and a facilitator of the Celebrating Families curriculum and the program here at NCADD. And today, uh, we are gathered for the acknowledgement of March being Parenting Awareness Month. And so this is a special parenting series of conversations from Celebrating Families. And the focus today is on what we want parents to know about education and awareness of SUD and mental health, and it is from a prevention perspective. So also as a caveat, uh, a prevention specialist, I think it's important to know what that is and some of these terms that we use in this field of work that others may not know what it is. So a prevention specialist in plain terms is a person who brings forth information and awareness and attention and education around substance use and mental health. Okay, so I am joined today um, by four wonderful individuals who you see here joined on this panel who are professionals in their own right as what I consider to be a parent specialist. Now they might not call themselves a, parent, a specialist, but I consider them uh, certainly to be one. And so I introduce to you today, <clears throat> excuse me, before us is Courtney Aldrich, which is a program, she is a program instructor of child and, and family development with the MSU Extension. Deborah Martinez, uh, she is parent involvement manager with Southwest Solutions. We have Barbara McCowan, who is a parent support partner uh, with Ruth Ellis Center. And then we have Robert Petaway, who is a parent support partner with Black family development. So thank you all so much uh, for being here and, and joining me today uh, for this webinar and on this panel. I would like, uh, like to allow each of you all a moment to share or to summarize the work that you do and what your title entails. So I'm just going to go ahead and start with Courtney. You can do that, please. Sure. Thank you, Lauren. 
So as Lauren said, my name is Courtney. I'm a program instructor with Michigan State University Extension. So my work um, is doing a whole lot of parenting education and MSU Extension is located throughout the state. So we do local uh, programming in our different counties. And then we also do statewide virtual programming as well. And in addition to parenting education, I also do early childhood professional development and some family engagement programming. So I'm really glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll go ahead and go to Deborah. Hi, thank you, Lauren. My name is Deborah Martinez, and I am the Parent Involvement Manager for Family Alliance for Change under Southwest Counseling Solutions. And under that role, I um, support and um, provide support and training to a lot of our parent support partners within Wayne County. We have about 17 parent support partners represented around Wayne County that are working with community mental health uh, throughout the county. And um, the other portion is that we also collaborate with Detroit Wayne Integrated Health Network under their uh, system of care work plan connections to, um, to focus on parent involvement and parent voice. Thank you. And let's go to um, Barbara. Thank you, Lauren. I'm Barbara McCowan. I'm employed at the Ruth Ellis Center. Our population is the LGBT community. And also what I do is I support parents on the goals of their choice and we work with them to achieve those goals. We empower, motivate, and encourage parents. And it is such a wonderful job. And I love doing it. And I love engaging with the community. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, we're gonna to go to Robert. Hello, um, once again, yeah, my name is Robert Petaway and I'm also a parent support partner with Black Family Development. Um, within my role with um, parent support, which for a nutshell, I really enjoy what I do because um, I believe in the, it takes a village to raise a child. And within that, I have the opportunity every day to be in the community to help empower, encourage, and be a support system to parents that at one point I was, and still am one of those parents that has a child with a challenge. And so within my role, I use my lived experience to you know, encourage and, and support and help other parents. Thank you so much. Um, so as you all see, this is why I call them specialists. Um, this is what I, what I believe uh, that you all are. And so thank you for being a part of this candid conversation uh, where I believe we will only have time to kind of graze the surface, um, but really have an opportunity to, to drive home the importance and the necessity of parents' involvement uh, and parents' engagement in prevention practices of SUD and mental health with their kids, uh, you know, within their families, but also within their communities. Okay, so let's just go ahead and dive in. Uh, and this is just going to be open. So it's, I, I may direct some questions um, to you all individually, but just feel free to go ahead and speak as, as you are led to do. So let's dive in. How important is it that parents have education and awareness about SUD and mental health? And if you can expound on your belief on just how important it is. No, go ahead. I'll let one of y'all go first. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tackle that. Um, I think for me personally, coming from a family who um, had lived experience, as Robert says, with SUDs and mental health, uh, it's critical. <laughs> I think it's critical for parent, for families to really have an understanding of what healthy healthy being is, right? What 
healthy, what being uh, a whole healthy person is, both spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Uh, we tend to pay a lot of attention to uh, our physical state, right? Uh, diabetes and asthma and, uh, you know, all those sort of benchmarks that our children sort of uh, gain as they are getting older and growing up. And, and sometimes our um, emotional and mental health is not, it's not focused on and it's just as important. So I think it's vital for parents to know, you know, what mental health is, what that, even the language, uh, and to move on from the stigma that comes around from just the words mental health. You know, and if I could just, that's why we started this series, um, just to your point, is to almost normalize what has been created as a stigma that we can't even you know, don't mention the word mental health or that is, whoa, you know, uh, and, and even drugs, you know, having these conversations, this is literally why this series um, exists, is to make it more of a candid or just a relaxed or normalized conversation that can be had and that should be had. And I also love, Deborah, that you mentioned, and this is one of the, the focuses of this curriculum of celebrating families, is that it puts a large focus on the whole person. And you are absolutely right in terms of we tend to think of healthy living um, primarily around our physical health, right? We, we look at that if we're exercising right and we're eating well. When, when overall health and the wholeness of a person is looking at all of those different aspects um, that you mentioned in terms of spiritual health, um, psychological health, our mental health, um, our social health in terms of our relationships. And I love that that's what this curriculum celebrating families really is the foundation and the focus of the, the curriculum. And I love that you mentioned that. Robert, what were you going to add to that? It, um, well, within the conversation, like we were saying that with everything that we're talking about, it, it, we, uh, some of us grew up in a time where it was everything that goes on stays in the home. Yep. You know, so if, if we had those challenges within our home, nobody ever knew we never told anybody hey look little johnny might have some stuff going on but we're not gonna tell nobody we're gonna cover it up we're gonna hide it so there was never a lot of opportunities mm -hmm. and so within that with within within the way that was so parents never asked questions mm -hmm. so in in this day and time it, i encourage parents to ask questions look up things you know, it's not wrong for you not to know, you know, if you don't know it, then ask, you know, if you see something that may be challenging to you with your child, don't look at it as, well, this is some, this is my child and I have to handle itself because there are people out here, there's organizations, there's um, community events, everything out here to help, you know, to give some type of encouragement guidance some type of something you know so we have to come out of the you know what i'm just gonna handle it myself you know mm -hmm. because that was one of the things of within my time and growing up it was like hey we handle it this is family you know child act up i'm gonna send him over to his uncle or send him back down south to his grandma no i i i had that within mine mm -hmm. but it it it, it I challenged myself to help my child. And that's when I ended up, you know, I allowed my child to talk to somebody, which, you know, you was like, well, you don't want to tell nobody that your child is receiving services because now you're going to be looked at funny. Mm. No, you don't. Because some of us, some of us, you know, the child need might need some services and hey, maybe you could too. It could benefit you too as well. Because sometimes within the household, it may be that the family just needs a third party to talk to. So. That's so good. You raised so many good points. Courtney, were you gonna chime in there? Yeah, I, it just what you were saying just sort of made me think about um, as parents, if we take the opportunity to gather information and educate ourselves, 
then we can become a source of information for those difficult conversations with our children. And that way we're not avoiding those difficult conversations because our kids, they're craving conversation. And if we avoid those conversations, they're gonna get their information somewhere. And it might not be from a reputable source. It might be from their friends. It might be from the media. But if we educate ourselves and we have good information, then we can open up those lines of communication to have these difficult conversations. And I just think that's really important to be that source of information and that support for your child so they feel free to come to you um, when they have these questions or when they have issues. So yeah, I just wanted to add that. Very good. Thank well, you. I'm don't just tag on to that real quick. <laughs> but um, parents, we have to remember and that we are our child's first teacher. So before they go to kindergarten, before they go to preschool, we are the ones that they look at and we learn from. So we have to remember that. So as much knowledge that we take in and we can provide to them, we are the first teacher. That raises, and so I have some notes here, and this is getting down in my notes, but you kind of brought it up, so I feel like this is a good insert here. Um, that notion of do as I say, not as I do. How effective was that or is that? You know, that notion that parents would say, I just, you know, don't worry about what I do, just do as I say because I'm your parent, I told you to do it. But the child is looking at also the behavior and the action. So I just, I wanna, what do you all think about that idea? Um, we have three of us thought. unmuted. So we have lots of thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I, will just, I will be very brief because I already spoke, but just to say that children are more likely to do what they see you doing than what you tell them to do. And that's just how kids work. They're watching, they're paying attention. and the other thing is, is that there can be some hypocrisy there and kids are, they're tuned into hypocrisy, right? They're looking for it. And so yeah. then you lose your credibility as a parent as well. So just remembering they're really going to do what you do more than they're going to do what you say. And you want to be careful of that hypocrisy. Very good. And I Thank wanted to Carver. say that I agree with you. Um, I was that parent, so I can identify as a parent that struggled many years with the substance use and the mental illness. And um, it was in my family. And I said, well, I did the same thing my parent told me. You follow what I told you to do, keep it in the home. And my children, I told them the same thing, but I did it in front of them, you know, or I was gone. I was missing parent, you know, because sometimes we don't understand that we're in, the, in that, that thing that got hold of us that we can't seem to break out of, you know, um, was a struggle for me. So it did transfer to some of my children, not all of them, but some of them did still struggling with substance use and also mental illnesses. And they also fighting with the fact that I want to go see a therapist. I, I, I think it's okay, but um, I display it before them. It's better to be able to be an example. So I'm that example that I won't pick up no matter what. Um, I'd use my resources to help me to build my mental health up so that I can be able to have a balance in life, to be able to have a sound mind and be able to make better decisions. So recovery is the best thing for me that I have experienced the best life ever. Mm. Thank you for, um, Barbara, just thank you for, for doing the work, um, you know, for yourself and then obviously for your, your family. And then it's just the ripple effect. I love to always throw in community there because it doesn't just stop there. It doesn't even just stop with ourselves, right? Again, it's in our families, but then it trickles out into the community. Anybody else want to add to that? Um, the notion about this um, do as I say, not as I do. I would say that as as the ladies pointed out, I agree with them. I also want to say that you know parenting or, or it's a progressive skill, right? You you didn't get a manual to to know it all, and it's okay that sometimes you make mistakes, right? And for and for as a parent to be able to acknowledge that and say I might have done that, it might have shown you that, but that wasn't the best for me at that point, and here's what I learned, right? And here's, here's where I uh, was able to turn things around. And, and now this is where I wanna be. 
Um, I think it's okay for parents to make those those sort of um, acknowledgements and and to be able to say I made that mistake and I might have shown you that way, but that isn't the the best way. And and to know that there are options, right? Uh, that that sometimes we live in a vicious cycle of trauma. And um, to be able to break the cycle and to say there are other options for us as family members and as families and communities. Such a good point. Also, that brings me to a point, a little shameless plug. On March 31st, we're going to end our um, Parenting Awareness Month with an old school versus new school fun family prevention uh, family feud game. And so old school versus new school, it's kind of talking about what we're talking about here. Some of these um, passed down, uh, tried and tested ways of doing, doing things and traditions and, and kind of in a making light, but also sincerity behind what worked, what didn't work, what did we learn from, how can we move forward um, and all of that. So I thought that that kind of fit right into what we're talking about right now. But I wanna hear also from you all, what are you finding in terms of the level of understanding that parents have now about SUD and mental health themselves? I mean, what have you all found in terms of what do parents know? Um, be honest, not a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Because the way it, it, it's, it's a difference, but it's not a difference. And, you know, we can say 10, 20 years ago, how drugs were distributed, how they were shown, how, you know, how, how open it was or closed it was back then to how more open it is now and how more access, you know, you can get to it. Because even the way that you know drugs and stuff were distributed, the way, you know, I'm, I looked at it as like, I never knew what that was when it was, you know, when I was coming up as a kid, but now it's just so open that, hey, you can walk down the street and somebody say, hey, do you want something? Mm -hmm. You know, so, um, but a lot of parents are still in that blind spot of, of not knowing, well, I don't know how my child gets to it because I do everything that I can to keep them away from it. You know, I pick them up from school. I take them to their friend's house. I pick them up, but it's so easy, you know, and that's, that's where we have to come together and understand how easy and accessible it is to the children that we as a community have to come together to, you know, because and that goes back to, you know, I talk about how when I was when I was younger coming up, you know, I had a neighborhood, a block that the parents told on your kids, mm -hmm. you do something wrong down the street, they know about it. They gonna come home and tell you, they gonna tell, you know, but us a lot of in this day and time, that's where it's like, I'm staying out of it. ain't got nothing to do with me. Because we do have those parents to say, don't worry, that's my child, I'll handle that. Mm -hmm. I'm just, you know, it's, it's, it's a community thing, but we've, a lot of it has turned into an individual thing. And that's where we as a community have to come back to the community, not individuals. Nice charge. That's nice charge for us. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. I mean, and that's what this is. That's what this conversation is really for, is for us to see ourselves and see what work um, that we need that we need to do, right? It, it starts with us. So that's why we're having this conversation so that we can identify with the charge and the tasks that we have before us. Did anyone want to add to, um, to that uh, question in terms of what do we or are we finding in our own individual fields of work in terms of the level of understanding uh, that parents have? I'm finding that, um, that the parents know and the children know what types of substances are out there and available and easy to get to because even as a child, when I started, my friends gave it to me. So peer pressure, um, you know, rejection, you know, because I'm so rejected that I started to talk down on my child. You're never going to be anything. You're not going to amount to nothing. I don't love you. Get out. You know, mm -hmm. those types of things are triggers for the children is what they tell me. So what I do as a parent, 
I get on their level, um, not um, talking at them, but listening. Active listening is so important to our young people because they already know where you're at. But I want to know, are you safe? Can I talk to you? Do you really care about me? Um, and being patient with them and, and making yourself approachable with a non-judgmental attitude really helps our young people and helps the parent as well because we feel shameful. We feel like we've been defeated in some kind of way. Oh, I'm not a good parent because my child decided to use drugs. You know, they're not finishing school. All these things, all these barriers are there and people talk about you, your neighbor, your cousin, your family members. And so we feel bad sometimes, but we have to pull ourselves together and still continue to press into that space called love and patience and endure with one another and try to be the best possible person that we can be. So I, I wanna say that um, just as I think about just technology and how sometimes our kids know more about phones than, than we do. <laughs> and, and we're like handing the phone to them, can you get me to this thing? And at the same time, thinking about just sort of new ways that kids are, um, I, I hate saying the word ingeniously coming up with ways of, 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 you know, taking substance or, you know, for instance, like the whippets, I never heard of the whippets before. And all of a sudden I see them everywhere. And I'm like, I remember parents saying, Debbie, what is this? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I looked at it. And I'm like, I have no idea. We looked it up together and we, you know, it was, it, she came to understand my, my child is using this, you know, um, to get high. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's very important because, for, you know, sometimes you think of, of drugs as just these hardcore kind of, you know, the, the cocaine, the marijuana, the heroin, and you go from, you know, one extreme to the other, but kids are, are dabbling with pills and household items. And, you know, there's so many different things that I feel like parents need to be aware of and understand that our, our, our young people um, are kind of dabbling with. And, yeah, so it's important that I feel like there is a greater awareness in, in certain areas, but also there still needs to be a lot of education um, still for parents. Love that. Thank you. I, I kind of wanted to add on just from a mental health perspective, I also feel like um, there's a lot that we as parents need to learn because there's a lot of new information coming out, right? We're understanding now the effects of trauma on children's behavior and the effects of adverse childhood experiences. And it's tempting to be dismissive of our children and their anxieties or their depression or, and just be like, you know what? I had to go through that. Like, and I turn, I'm fine. Like here I am. I, I, and you're going to have to struggle too. But I think now that we're learning more about these things that play into mental health, that mental health plays into some of these behavioral issues. And if we can learn more about mental health, I, I find that youth are teaching me about mental health. Um, youth are teaching me about what to look for and the struggles that they're going through and the feelings that they're having and the things to look for. And Cutting, cutting wasn't a thing, right? When I was young, it's a thing now, right? There are things that I'm learning from the youth in my life and that I think all adults, we need to learn so that so that we don't do the thing that Barbara was saying where we think it's about us. It's, it's not about us as parents. It's not a reflection on how good or bad of a parent we are. It's where our children are in their world right now developmentally, excuse me, in, in our society as it exists right now. Seeing a lot of comments in the chat, kind of talking about the change in our society and the issues with our society. We have to pay attention to that because um, that's affecting mental health and we need to learn about those effects of mental health, how that plays in. Thank you. I'm gonna um, yeah go to the chat in just a moment, but you know, you all raised just so many good points. This is why you are specialists, but again, I'm just so, Thank you for just raising so many good points. Um, I'm hearing also just like communication and the importance of communication. Uh, a big part of what the curriculum celebrating families focuses on is communication, but particularly effective communication. And I know someone mentioned active listening. It might have been Barbara. 
who mentioned about active listening, the curriculum focuses on that, like, well, what is that? I, you know, I, I hear you, but what is active listening? Um, and, and so this is where we get into healthy living in terms of the whole individual. It is healthy to have effective communication. And so we get into in the curriculum, I keep pointing back there, it's right behind me, um, but what, what um, effective communication is and so how that's a part um, of, of living healthy. Um, I wanna kind of shift gears a bit. See, I'm, I have some guy, some notes that I'm following, but we're, we're bouncing around and, and that's really good. But I wanna shift gears a bit because I feel like we're getting into an opportunity to discuss what children face. Um, and so what children may be going through uh, as they are growing, as they are evolving, just as they're progressing and journeying through life. Um, that could lead them to begin experimenting uh, and using um, and, and thus abusing drugs. And so, you know, can, can you know, any of you all speak to a little more about the challenges that children face? So that what, what are parents to be looking for? Um, and how can they, you know, have some empathy, understanding towards what what uh, their children or children are facing. Anyone? What are they facing? You, you, you know, you all mentioned some of the things. I mean, we talked, uh, some, a couple of you all mentioned about uh, anxiety uh, and depression. And um, I, I want us to expound a little more because I want us to be able to have parents to be on the lookout or to, again, I, I want to say empathy, to want empathize what children are facing today. I would say the um, peer pressure, watch the school, who your child is hanging around after school, um, social media sites that they're entertaining. Um, if you know that your child usually engaged with you, now they're withdrawn. I'm, I don't want to talk about it right now. Um, if I'm hiding or want to just come out in the dark. You know, if I'm just disobeying every rule in the house is a sign also that maybe something is going on that we need to probably talk about. And um, violence, anger, um, just for no reason, I'm triggered of everything you say. I don't want to hear nothing you got to say, mama, you know, or dad. Um, those types of things is, is probably a flag. You might want to just take a second look and say, hey, let's talk a little bit. You know, you got a little time. I want to talk to you or something. And be gentle, you know, use a feather. Don't talk about you don't clean your room. You don't, don't do nothing right, but do find something that you are doing right. And then let's talk, start a talk conversation right there. Yeah. And well, and also with those conversations that you having with your child, keep them, don't, don't go off on a whole slew and long drawn out just kind of no. be direct with it and and make it, it make it to the point you know because you got to remember the kid attention span ain't that long so you got to get what you need for them to hear in those first couple minutes because after that everything is blah 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 so make it count with every time that we that every time that you talk make it count but at the same time, we do some, you know, parents, we do have to have some empathy within our kids. It, it's not all, it's not always, well, you're a kid, you, you will learn or, you know, be tough. You know, we have to have some type of empathy because you got to remember every day that they walk out that door, they have challenges. When they walk off that porch, it's a challenge. You know, so so we have to be empathy, empathetic about what they go through within their lives. Because it wasn't as tough for us. You know, we we our chances of leaving the house and coming home were greater than it is now. You know, so we we have to understand that they they do have it tough. But then we have to kind of talk to our kids about that and and build that relationship with them to say, hey. If there's a problem or you see something, you can come talk to me. Whether it be something going on with you, it might be something that your friend might be going through. They confided in you. You don't know what to do. Mom, dad, hey, I got this thing. You know, and it may not be for me to go to your to, to that back to that child and say, I my daughter told me, 
you know, but you may be able to provide some information to your child to say, hey, talk to your friend and get them to go to the counselor, get them to talk to the teacher, get them to talk to their parent about what may be going on. Yeah, I would, I would also, you know, Courtney made a great point about uh, how sometimes we can be very dismissive of how our kids feel or our teens feel, right? And it's like, oh, get over it kind of thing. Um, and, and it's really important to be able to focus and empathize on what they're going through, right? They're, the, the breakups with the boyfriends, the fact that they um, might have gained a little weight, uh, the fact that their Instagram is not, not everyone's like following them, you know, it, it, these things really weigh down on them. And, you know, some, some kids um, have a hard time socially making friends and, every Saturday night someone's out in their home and so these things really cause um, you know isolation depression anxiety um, the pressure of of uh, the transition and into adulthood also so you know all these things are things that we as parents really need to understand that that our children our youth and children are going through and 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 let's not forget this pandemic that we're in right and the fact that this has been hard on all of us including our children and that they have they have emotions they have thoughts and um, and they have to process them just like we do thank you such so great. Um, Anna in the chat says, I think there is an incredible feeling of hopelessness in society right now. And focusing on how to build up their mental health is something we should remember. Um, I mean, I think that's that's so important to to understand. And, and that's kind of, you know, what I was thinking in terms of what children are facing, we tend to sometimes minimize it as, you know, like you said, uh, like Deborah and Courtney just kind of alluded to that, um, you know, that's not really anything, you know, or that's small or just kind of brush it off. But even, you know, identity, um, uncertainty of purpose, um, comparison, direction, you know, again, we mentioned peer pressures. And so it's important to identify, well, how can and I think we might have touched on this, but if we want to elaborate more, how can parents support in this growth um, and in this, this progression, again, of the, the challenges that are very real um, to what children are facing? I can, I can start because I think it kind of is a follow-up from where we were heading. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I often say to parents, like, kids' perception is their reality. <laughs> so if they're perceiving something as a stress, that's real for them, even right. though we may not be able to wrap our heads around it. And, and so I think our job as parents is to gather information, right? Let's, let's ask the questions to them, like, hey, so what was going on with that? This active listening that Barbara was talking about, or tell me more about that. And sometimes as parents, what we do is we listen to solve their problems and we mean well, right? We wanna come in and tell them, well, this is what you need to do. But really sometimes they just need us to listen. <laughs> and so this has been a hard lesson for me as a parent, but I'm learning. And, and I sometimes I ask my older children, they're all in their early twenties now, but like, where do you want me in this conversation? Do you just want me to be listening right now? Do you want me brainstorming ideas with you? Or do you want me to help you solve this problem? And that's a game changer for how that conversation goes. Because once I've, I've almost asked permission to give my suggestions, now it's not unsolicited advice. Now they've said, yeah, I actually do want your help in solving this. And they're more receptive to it. So just some thoughts about how we can support our children, just being that listener that Barbara was talking about and offering our support, but not coming in with our answer, because we've got great answers. But if they're not ready to hear it, they're just going to tune it out and come up with all the reasons why they're not going to do it. So having allowing ourselves to kind of just step back and pause and gather the information and listen for understanding and then um, offering solutions if they're ready to hear them. Thank you. I might be going left field. I don't know. Go with me. 
do you have you all heard of this show called Euphoria? No one's known. I've, no one's I've, heard of it. I've heard of it, and from what I heard of it, I'm like, I don't really know if I want to look at it. But it sounds like I'm a, it, it's a conversation piece to to watch it and to have the, that type of conversation with your child. I watched it. So I heard so much about it. It's a show. It's in its second season. The mm -hmm. reason I'm bringing it up is I, I found it as helpful research to the work that we do it to me it was very dark it was i didn't really know what i was going into when i watched it again it's on its second season now entering into the third uh, the second season just completed and it's a show about a, a young girl a teenager i believe she's around 17 and she is um addicted to drugs particularly like i think lsd there's some snorting there's some psychedelics and i mean just think of the word euphoria I get why they named it that. Uh, and, and we kind of go on this journey with Rue. And, you know, it's it's just a very interesting show. And again, I found it to be helpful to the work of prevention. Again, looking at a teenager and, and looking at some of the things she dealt with, some identity crisis. Uh, she dealt with divorce and, and separation of her parents. And so, again, how she kind of of dealt with it, but it also made me think it, this is a very popular show and a lot of young children are watching it. I mean, it, it's with teenagers. It features teenagers dealing with very real grown issues of, 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 um, of addiction, of, you know, of drug use and abuse and of sex. And, and it, it goes very graphic. Uh, I would only encourage to watch it for, I mean, just, it is very good, insightful research. It, it is challenging to watch though, but I, I, what I'm trying to get at is I was wondering, you know, how are parents talking with their children about what they're seeing and how the drugs are perceived? Let me tell you this quote from Euphoria. This is from the teenager Rue. Her name is Rue. And uh, it's, she said, drugs are cool until they ruin your life and your family, then they are not cool. Drugs are cool until they ruin your life and your family, then they are not cool. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, so one hand, drugs are cool up until this point. So even just that mindset and that perception, I mean, what is that? What do you all think that that is saying? It is saying that when you start at, you know, when you first not the first hit high you have is you trying to get back to that. And then as you go down that dark hole, you lose control. The life is no longer the same. You start doing things. You say, I'll never do that. It can happen. Um, my parent will never do that. Those things play an active role. You might lose your life in the middle of it. Some people don't make it through. They die in addiction. So it is a dark shadow going through, but it looked like it's fun when it introduced it. They didn't give me no um, warnings warning signs or any side effects that nothing was told like this is going to be fun for you come on go to this party and I want you to try this so it was introduced like like a um, cup of kool-aid and I thought I, I, I taking it um I wanted more you know and then after a while I've lost control the loss of control and the deception that it, that the um mask that you put on because it's a mask once you take that drug here come the mask you start to hide Sh shamefulness comes in a lot of deception comes into your life and you tell yourself, I want to do better, but sometimes it's just a process and we have to give ourselves a break. You know, that's why we don't beat people up that's going through substance disorders because it, you already feel that pain already. You already feel that void. So you want to help something to fill that void and help us to, to move away from that type of mindset into that healthy mindset is don't pick the first one up. Yeah. Oh, and, and, drugs is is cool in the beginning because it, it it don't come with instructions for one and so when it's cool when you first trying it and you with your friends and y'all acting up and being goofy and silly you know but it doesn't come with that that instructions that once you start taking it your body starts to adjust and now you want it and you want it and it doesn't come with a price tag that this is how much you're going to end up spending on it 
And now you don't have that type of money to spend it. Now it's not cool anymore because now you stealing from your parents, going through their purses, selling items out the house. Now it's not cool. But in the beginning, there is no instructions that this is how much you should take. And there's no instructions to tell you that if you hit it this one time, you won't be addicted to it. What I love is that, and I'm gonna, Deborah, I know you want to say something, but I love that you all are really going there. And what I mean by going there is really talking about what can happen, not what will happen, but it, it can happen that you can get into this addictive cycle. And so a lot of um, young people, particularly, they're not thinking of what can happen, especially in the long term. And, and we get into addiction that that could not happen to me. But like you're so far fetched to whoa, you know, to talk about that. But what I love is that you all are talking, and this is what parents, right? We want to um, to speak about this because while it might seem cool and, and be cool in the beginning, well, this is what this coolness, right, could lead to. And this is you don't want to get caught up in this, right? And so I love that you all are are really going there um, with the level of the conversation that parents can have and should have with their children. Deborah, uh, You know, honestly, and, and, and take this with a grain of salt, I believe that's how the, the saying is, is that uh, Hollywood would never be able to really portray what actually happens with the person that's using and also the family. You know, you have people, beautiful people you have that are in these shows. And, and, and this, is, this is why informing yourself as a parent and having the education and really the information so that you are the source of information for your children and not Netflix is so important because Netflix will show them. You know, I remember watching a couple of shows that I was like, oh my goodness. And I'm like, okay, am I like, really out of touch with what you know it's going on nowadays with our young people but it it does sort of um glorify and it, it it's it, it makes it sort of in a way uh, like it's so easy to get out of it you don't have to eat and and so the message can be really distorted and as you know courtney said um kids are developing and their perception is their reality and and so i think it's 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 important that that we understand the power of media, the power of music, the power of you know all these things that draw our children's and our youth's attention, and somehow sometimes they can be louder than your own voice, right? And so I think establishing. This is where I think like a lot of the chat room says, you know, old school moms, you know, establishing those boundaries and clear sort of expectations and consequences, even when the kids don't do it, it's extremely important around substance abuse and around mental health. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Um. Well, as far as with the drugs is with, with parents and having a conversation with your child, um, have that conversation with them that that hit or high or what it is temporary. You know, it is temporary and but it can have a long term effect. So, you know, having that con open conversation with them with what that may be and what, you know, that that short term hit what it may end up being for you in the future you know it, it's it's not it's 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 not you know um what would i say is you lecturing them to have that conversation it's it's a parent to child conversation about life and drugs and you know what is what's out here you know because every child has you know especially when you get to the teenage thing you you they they know what it is you know have that conversation with them about what's the new drug because they know because one of their friends then either done it or talk about it you know because in in the in the world we in now yeah you have that conversation with a cigarette is a drug mm -hmm. have that conversation with them about smoking a cigarette 
hey, it's vapors out here now. So talk to them, really talk to them about what, what do they use to for for that high, for that excitement? What's around them? You know, and don't be afraid to ask them what what is it that they can have access to? What is because you I hear a lot, I'm hearing a lot about conversation and um we might have talked about the importance of this, but how do we have the conversation? I think we might have talked about maybe pulling from experiences. Um, maybe there's an opportune time, but also I want to ask, well, what's a good age uh, to begin speaking to your children about such a heavy weighted um, conversation? I mean, is there an ideal age? What's a, what's a good age? It's interesting because I often say just talk early and talk often. I, I, you know, I don't assign an age to it, but and it just totally goes with the question that just came up in the chat. Like, how do we make our children comfortable to talk about these difficult subjects? And I think it's got to be just a, a matter of fact conversation where you're sharing your information and your values in small tidbit snippets, not as a long lecture, like Robert said, or they're like, blah, blah, blah. You know, there goes mom and dad again. But, you know, just talk early, talk often, talk at a level that's age appropriate for them. When you see things on media, what they're exposed to, ask them what they think about. Like, hey, I noticed that character in that TV show was smoking a cigarette. What do you think about that? Like, let's just have, like, we're just gonna use what we're seeing in our environment and our environment gives us plenty of opportunities to bring up these conversations. And it doesn't have to be a, we're gonna sit down and have the talk and eye to eye, like right now. Busy hands make for good conversation, right? We're both cooking together or we're planting flowers or I don't know, in the car. I had some of the best conversations in the car because we didn't have to look right at each other with my kids. And so it's just making yourself available. And when your child tells you something, like what they saw, what they heard, what, you know, it's not freaking out. It's just listening without judgment. Um, and that makes you a safe space. They know that, oh, I can have these conversations and I'm not going to get judged. So those are just a couple thoughts that I have. Just good thoughts. As we are gearing to prepare to close this wonderful uh, dialogue and conversation, and again, we've just kind of had an opportunity to graze the surface. I want to kind of land at a soft spot for the parents who are uh, watching and engage with us today and who might come back later. I think it's important to um, understand that parents are dealing with their own set of issues that may have been even unresolved, right? And so just because you become a parent, right, your own issues don't just magically go away. So I'm really looking at this, you know, this parent, um, which is a person, but is a parent to a child. And so what are some things that you all would share to parents in terms of how they deal just with their, their own mental health as they are parenting? While they're going through their own set of challenges and their own issues, right? That a lot of times children don't understand what parents are, are going through. What would you all say to lend as support and hope for parents? Um, do you get what I'm saying? How would you all support a parent who is, I mean, this is to go without said that because every person, right, whether you're a parent or not, is going through something. But then to add being um, a caregiver, a caretaker, a parent um, of another human being, who has their own set of challenges. I'm showing kind of the cycle of we all go through things, right? And we're all going through things. Mm -hmm. um, but what can we say particularly to parents um, of what they should be doing just to take care of themselves? And so how can they be healthy for themselves first? Um, well, I'll, I'll start. Uh, one, um, get yourself some self-care. You know, and, you know, that is always the most important part. Get yourself some self-care um, and think about the conversations that you may be having with your child when you talking about certain things. Don't don't make your child a therapist. Don't lay it on the child. You know, if it's an adult issue, find an adult. 
to talk to. Don't lay that on your child, you know. So, and that's you know some of the you know what we do sometimes. We just we just need somebody to talk to. The kid is the only person in the house, so the kid is my friend at that time. I'm just gonna tell him, no, find you an adult, find a neighbor, go next door to you know somewhere, find some, and, and you know. Um, if you feel that your child is in need of that, maybe you might need to think about it as well, that I'm getting my child some, some help. Maybe I might need some too, you know? Um, and that's what kind of some with, with the parents that I, I deal with, that I, I, you know, within your child's treatment, they have a goal. So within that goal, there are steps that they take. So with parent support, you have a goal. We get you through them steps to get you to that goal. So when your child get there, you right there with them. Y'all can walk at it together. You know, I, I like to say, I, I remember kind of looking back at some of the things that my mom would do. <laughs> and, um, she passed away when I was 28. And I remember just sitting with my sister and saying, oh, mom was only 30 something when that happened. And, um, and then she went through all these things and it sort of gave me this um, uh, sense of, of, I guess, relief, but also empathy towards her and understanding she was going through something and she needed help and she needed to work these things out. And it did impact her parenting and it impacted us, but now I know why. And so one of the things that I would say, you know, I know it's cliche, but they always say it, put your mask on first before you can help someone else, right? In the airplane, like when it comes down. And it's very true. Parents, um, I, I, you know, we, we, we really highly recommend that you take care of you. The best thing you can do for your child is be a healthy person. You know, uh, a lot of times we think about, oh, I want to give them shoes and, and, and mm -hmm. the latest phone. And, but when you're taking care of yourself, when you, uh, you know, uh, again, those were my biggest memories of my parents is when I knew they were well, I was well, you know what I mean? Because the whole household was well. And so um, one of the things that I love saying about, you know, what have you learned about my, your parent from your parents is kindness. When they showed kindness to others and they were kind to themselves, we learned that. And we, and that was instilled in us and the importance of, of, of kindness to yourself and to others. And so again, just, you know, taking care of yourself, like um, Robert said, self-care is important um, and, you know, kind of like uh, coming to that realization that I may need some support and it's okay for me to get that. And I'm going to speak a little bit about generational things, you know, things that, come from way back from great, great, great grandma, great, great, great grandpa. And it just sort of comes all the way. You see it, you can see the line. And I think it's important that we have the courage to stand up and say, it breaks here with me because I'm gonna be the one that goes to look for that help that I need. Beautiful, thank you. I wanna hear last, some last words from Barbara and Courtney as well. What are we sharing with, go ahead. I would love to say natural supports. I look for, um, but sometimes your friends don't want to hear you. So I reach for other friends outside of that network. I join support groups. You have to build your natural supports around your children because everybody needs help. And sometimes we need a break. You know, as parents, well, I can't find somebody. We have to, because you need some, a mental break from everything for just you to have some time to build on yourself. Um, you have to remind yourself, I'm an individual. Sometimes I forgot about that. I'm taking care of everybody else, but I forgot. Now I'm broken. When the whole train stops, you know, when mom's hurt, uh-oh, everybody's down. So who's going to help me? You know, so we have to start being proactive instead of waiting till my train break, start to figure out how to break in between the break. And so what I did with my children is that the first 30 minutes I get home, I need that 30. I need 30 to come, come with you to think about what we're gonna eat and prepare myself so that I can be that mother for you that you really like, you know, instead of that screaming when no, go on, you know, what those you really like. <laughs> yes, 
don't let the other part come out. So I've learned right. to, um, you know, to what works for me and what work works mm -hmm. for you. So it's a team effort. And so children understand team. So you get your time and I get mine. So we'll work together and keep loving on each other and build that family. Love it. Courtney? We love that. You know, it's funny when I teach about self-care, sometimes I have parents push back and they're like, so now I'm adding self-care to my list. I have so much other stuff to do. I don't have time for this. And I often say like, imagine yourself, you're like a big pitcher of water and you're pouring yourself out all day long and you pour yourself out for your job and your household and your partner and your children and, and your whatever your obligations are. And at the end of the day, your pitcher is empty. And you're going to be expected to pour yourself out again tomorrow. How are you going to do that if you don't refill your pitcher? So it's, and, and sometimes it can be as small of a thing as in that little space of time, like before you fall asleep at night, like you've gone to bed, you haven't gone to sleep. Maybe you're just going to take some deep breaths and just take five or 10 minutes just to center yourself, right? I'm just going to five or 10 minutes right before I fall asleep. That might be all you can do, but it's something. So just really remembering not only that you need to do it for yourself, but that's how you can do for your, everyone else again the next day. Thank you. Any lasting remarks um, from our, our panel here? I just want to thank you all so much um, for being such a beautiful panel in terms of uh, your experiences that are shared um, and your expertise. Um, and so I, I really do consider you all specialists and I just thank you for being you and just for the work um, that you all do. And thank you so much for joining uh, this conversation from Celebrating Families. I hope that we can have a part two of some sort, um, you know, in some sort of way we bring you all back. Um, and I just think this is just the beginning of, of just a wonderful, this is what we're here to do, partnerships, collaboration, uh, all for the greater good. So again, I just thank you all. Um, for those of you all who are watching um, and who will tune in later, I invite you um, March 31st as NCADD prepares to close out uh, our, our uh, Parenting Awareness Month activities with an old school versus new school prevention family feud. Again, March 31st, uh, the details on how to log on to that are on our website, ncadd-detroit.org. Again, thank you all for joining. It is our hope that something that was said was helpful um, to you and for you. Uh, be encouraged, encouraged, excuse me, that there are resources to support you on this journey of parenting. Uh, and that prevention is always a wonderful place to start, a great place to start. Um, and so we'll see you all next time on Conversations from Celebrating Families, also parents. I want you to know you too can be a prevention, a prevention specialist by becoming aware uh, and educating yourself uh, with all of these great tools that you were given here today. So again, thank you uh, until next time on Conversations from Celebrating Families.